Um, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank my research group, thank the conference organisers for the invitation. It's great fun being here. A little bit about the group, just 30 seconds on us. It was a multidisciplinary group of, of epidemiologists, of um, medical anthropologists through to biostatisticians. We have an interest in uh, some of the, the interaction of social and biological pathways, how social structure impacts on some of the decision making, such as the third age of childbearing, how that in turn uh, also becomes literally embodied uh, in the creation of social disadvantages that are then transferred from one generation to the next. We see it every day, uh, but we have uh, not a detailed theoretical understanding of how this can be tackled from within reproductive epidemiology. So we have particular expertise in cohort studies uh, and in data linkage to try and bring together some data sets that we can use for looking at some of these questions. So today, it's, it's a new sort of topic where I was trying to get a, a, a spin on the 21st century technologies. And John's, John's given a fabulous introduction there about how an emerging technology can actually alter uh, a, a very significant parameter that influences subsequent uh, health. So sort of four questions today. What maternally mediated factors influence poor uh, perinatal outcomes? Uh, is there, uh, do we have some evidence of programming of the reproductive axis as a result of some upstream factors that can be altered by social circumstance? And when fertility fails in the 21st century, uh, what do we rely upon and really how, uh, how safe and effective is it? Uh, but then also, is there some curious uh, potential benefit from some of it? And then finally, can we actually look at some of these uh, infertility treatment, for example, as a natural experiment to learn something about uh, the interaction of social and biological pathways? So how can we actually make a testable hypothesis about this? And I've, I've been rather uh, drawn to life history theory, a sort of generalizable model that with reproductive strategies across different species, there's sort of three broad components of investment in terms of how much effort it is to enter into a reproductive act, uh, how much investment is, the, is there in the pregnancy itself? And John's indicated uh, that, that there can be variable amounts of investment with very important consequences for offspring. And then finally, the postnatal weaning. And I've, I've flagged here that perinatal death is actually a very interesting uh, uh, area of investment as sort of an outcome uh, uh, of, of the uh, early, uh, early life investment, which has changed extraordinarily in the 20th, 19th, 20th and 21st century in Australia lives in an extraordinarily uh, privileged place where our perinatal death rates are amongst the lowest, absolute lowest in the world, as are maternal death rates. So uh, many of you work in a lab, and of course the, the mouse is a very nice example of a, of a very low investment uh, strategy because it's going to have a very short life, so it doesn't invest much in the pregnancy, uh, delivers immature young very early, gets back in the mating very fast, and it's accompanied by very high perinatal death rates. Uh, so by contrast, we're quite a different strategy and so we can actually, uh, and so while people are bemoaning the reduction in family sizes and the 28-year-old kids living at home, uh, those kids are probably going to live to be 100 uh, because they're getting such an enormous investment in them. Uh, so we can actually uh, relate something as simple as uh, uh, perinatal death rates and, pr and project the, f the future longevity of the population in Australia. And this has actually been done before. So many of you will recognise this is, this is one, of, uh, one of the maps that was used uh, by the Barker group in trying to estimate the relationship between birth weight and cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is the, the UK uh, distribution of cardiovascular disease. Red's bad, green is good. And so what uh, now 30 years ago, uh, 31 years ago, Barker and Osborne uh, produced this neat little scattergram, which is really just of perinatal death rates and death rates from cardiovascular disease 60 years later and generated the perfect image that fits into life history theory. Um, the, this is mere ecological data and it's considered very poor, but they have then since gone on to uh, replicate this elsewhere. But what they also proposed was that this was a mechanism uh, by which social deprivation was being perpetuated. Uh, and in, uh, the, 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 the mediating factor in this argument was that it was maternally mediated diet altering fetal development that was then flowing on to the next generation. Now, what we are aware of is that there's a multitude of other potential factors that can operate uh, at different critical periods. Uh, this is firstly, it was replicated in, in many different cohort studies, and, and so we, we're all happy that it's a fairly robust and stable effect. Mm. Um, now, even though the idea of critical periods is not new, Stockard, uh, Stockard uh, uh, developed this concept in 1921. However, if we apply it in the contemporary context, we can now see there is a, a, a multitude 
of questions around how we actually develop a theory about when do we measure what and when is it going to be critical and for whom. Um, now, when dealing with population cohorts, there's a neat way, there's a neat, neat way into this, which is particularly doing periods of sharp economic and social transition, we can actually parse different phases of life. We can actually, uh, for example, in the top here, oh good, it does work, wonderful. This is the effect of, of age on obesity. So you can actually see that, that, that obesity increases with, as we age, that's pretty standard, about a couple hundred grams a year in contemporary society, for example. However, it then goes over a cliff. Now then, partly that's due to two factors. <coughs> One is that the uh, people who are overweight and, uh, and obese don't, aren't represented in the population anymore because they die more frequently. Secondly, however, is that the older population here, the oldest population, actually uh, survived a critical period that uh, for, for, there was a risk factor for obesity that the younger cohort uh, uh, members didn't survive. Now, and just to demonstrate that, there is a very interesting... Um, there's, there's also a secular game here, which means that by year, everybody's getting fatter on average. However, on the far right here, it's extremely interesting that there's a dip showing that, in fact, it's the baby boomers, boomers who are at the greatest risk of, con of developing obesity. That the cohorts born um, since, the, 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 since the 1950s actually have a lower adult risk of, of developing obesity. It's really quite interesting. So, the, and some of you will understand the notion of washout. So at a population level, it is as though uh, the previous susceptible generation with the epidemic of heart disease is gradually fading out of the existing population and they're being replaced by people who are not as susceptible to the obesogenic environment. Now, this is incredibly important for developing human policy, but then also making projections about the longevity of the current, uh, of future cohorts of individuals. Now, it's also very useful, this strategy, of separating things into, into aging period and cohort effect is also very useful for identifying emerging vulnerable populations. For example, in this exact figure here, uh, we can act, it's a figure of, uh, uh, of uh, black and white Americans. This is taken from a US paper. And the real alarm here is that amongst young black women, they're going through a stratospheric uh, increase in the prevalence of obesity in, in America. So they constitute a, a very, very special target group. By contrast, the, uh, the, 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 both the white, and the, the white and the black male peers in particular go through a much shallower curve. Now, I should flag that unlike most demographic characteristics, this is in turn also rather more complicated because we've actually got within a single individual multiple generations, uh, multiple cohorts acting at once and multiple factors. So the, 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 the cell that became us was in fact nurtured directly by our mother, uh, by our grandmother in the creation of, of our mother's ovary from which, you know, the egg uh, emerged that gave birth to us. So in fact, we've simultaneously got um, uh, three cohort effects and, and three period effects, and, and really this is a, a very complex uh, uh, thing to, for people to argue about. Now, what I might do now is simply step through briefly um, uh, three cohort studies trying to illustrate how we can try and compress the time scale uh, of, of some of these events. Ideally, we would start developing cohort studies that simply run for 60, 80 years, but none of us are going to live long enough. Uh, so we can actually do some tricky stuff uh, called a synthetic cohort analysis where we grab young children at one age, make an observation, and then you grab another cohort from a similar or comp comparable population at another age and then project forward in time. So you get overlapping age bands to see what the, what the future is going to hold for us. So there's uh, the Generation 1 cohort, a prospective birth cohort um, in South Australia, uh, the Lucina cohort, which is sort of like a three-generation study of, of programming of the reproductive axis with a focus on PCOS, and then the South Australian birth cohort. Generation 1, it was set up s straight up as a programming, uh, as testing the Barker hypothesis, but we examined diet at two points in pregnancy, not one, because we thought there'd be an early effect, and there was. We were able to show that early... Uh, early protein carbohydrate balance in the first trimester was what was the driver of birth weight and pondral index, not the third. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, we had serial measurements. We, we had really uh, multiple, multiple, like the RAIN study, had multiple uh, serial observations uh, of these kids now out to uh, nine years of age. And what we were able to find was that firstly, we can now identify discrete growth trajectories uh, in the children, not just during fetal life, but then also postnatally that predisposed them 
to obesity. And these growth trajectories, there's a little bit of crossing, but in fact, the, the catch up, so called catch up period is very narrow, only in the first six months. And then the kids settle in a pretty stable uh, 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 trajectories. What we found was that uh, the, the kids on the high growth trajectory um, or the increasing growth trajectory were the ones that were at particular increased risk of obesity at age nine. And the biggest driver of being on that trajectory was actually maternal body composition uh, in the first trimester around the time of conception. So this is really quite interesting evidence to suggest that we are actually in the midst of a transgenerational amplification of obesity, uh, at least in Australia, and it's going to be, and, and potentially other countries as well. Now we then went on, uh, and we actually looked then at uh, insulin uh, resistance in the kids, and then found again that in fact there was an independent contribution of maternal body composition at conception. So the increase in body size is actually uh, through technological and, and food and nutrition transition and social transition is going to be a major driver both of patterns of fetal development and chronic disease risk in the future. Uh, particularly as I've demonstrated in amongst, for example, um, uh, young black American women. The second cohort I refer to is the Lucina cohort. These are, uh, we basically went back to a hospital and extracted all female records that survived the discharge in the mid 70s and then found them again after 30 years and enrolled them into a cohort study. Uh, we were interested in, in the, uh, how obstetric factors and, and pregnancy conditions uh, increase, uh, were related to programming of the reproductive axis and particularly PCOS. So there were some thousands in this and we found them, you know, 30 years, it's Adelaide, 50% were in the white pages after 30 years. So it wasn't, a, the other 50% were a bit tougher though. And so what we have is a, 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 the, in the blue band, uh, the live cohort of around 1,000 women we then have both family reports and medical reports on the history of, of the parental background, and then we have reports of their own, um, uh, not just their pregnancies, but then also any reproductive disorders. And we've discovered that, in fact, firstly, the prevalence of PCOS is remarkably high. Uh, it's up uh, with Rotterdam criteria, it's 18%, and under NIH conditions, it's 8%. There had never been a prevalence estimate done before in a representative sample, as just remarkably. But we also found that about a quarter of the women by the age of 30 actually had real concerns about the fertility. And 10% had already been uh, to see a physician. And 4% uh, and of them are now off, uh, giving birth uh, through IVF, uh, with nearly a comparable amount through ovulation induction. But what we did find was that um, if we go back to the previous cohort of the Generation 1 cohort, we had the high trajectory babies now, those high birth weight babies, if you project forward 30 years, what we have found in the Lucina cohort is that they, in fact, tend to have hyperandrogenism as an isolated symptom. Have, by contrast, uh, those babies with a low pondral index of birth uh, in, uh, it looked like the traditional thrifty phenotype that, that the Barker group talks about, and they, in turn, are more predisposed to having the full blown PCOS symptom of metabolic disorder, derangement, and uh, insulin uh, resistance. And, and ovulatory infertility. Now, the final cohort they refer to is the South Australian birth cohort. This is a whole of population cohort in South Australia. It's, about, it's roughly 320,000 births at the moment. Um, it's a whole perinatal collection linked to all of the birth defects registry, and sitting behind that are all cycles of assisted conception uh, for the entire state over a 17-year period between January 86 and December 2002. I want another 10 years of data, but um, uh, funding bodies just think this is it's, it's all been done. However, the entire um, uh, landscape has shifted in this area and we have no surveillance system on this at all at the moment uh, with regards to adverse outcomes. There's no systematic process. Now, what we were trying to do is, is really separate the sources of risk and identify modifiable sources of risk, both in terms of you know, uh, the treatment strategy like multiple embryo transfer, but then also the specific, specific interventions, IVF versus ICSI and cryo versus fresh and so on. And um, we had a series of questions, I, I'm afraid I don't have time to read them all, but we actually addressed all of these questions in a single study, uh, trotted through them. Um, and what we were able to do was, this is just the design, we hooked up all of the ART data uh, to the perinatal collection, 302,000 births. Uh, there was a, the population prevalence of birth defects was 5.8%. It was elevated to about 8.5% um, in the uh, ART group. Uh, we were able to examine all of every combination, every uh, individual treatment and combination of treatments that was uh, uh, available uh, at the time. And we had actually, unlike many of the studies that done internationally, we had pretty good uh, control over confounding factors. 
uh, and that came in handy. All the data were coded to ICD-9. I shan't read that out for you, but it's uh, down to four-digit code there. However, I will show you this very briefly, which is that we were able to replicate um, Michelle Hansen's, uh, uh, this is actually in the, in the middle of Michelle Hansen uh, meta-analysis on, on IVF and birth defects. It sits right in the middle, which is a nice place to be in a systematic review, I've got to say. Uh, so uh, an overall odds ratio of 1.3 for any birth defect uh, with any, any, any treatment, uh, that jumped around uh, substantially depending on whether it was a fresh or frozen or an, or an ICSI cycle. Uh, the worst fresh cycle was, was ICSI at 9.9% major birth defects. I should say these are followed out to five years of age. And if you only go to birth, then you miss half of them, basically. So it's important to actually have the longer follow-up and then you also pick up the cardiac defects, which seem to be a real target for some of these interventions. Uh, down the bottom, we also found that there was an increased risk of people um, with a background of infertility um, and where they had been uh, given ovulation induction alone outside of the clinic. Now, even the people with a background of infertility, in fact, uh, we now know that they've been uh, given ovulation induction drugs, but not through a supervised channel uh, with the IVF clinic, and that carries a, a separate independent risk. Now, in terms of procedures, this uh, very briefly summarises uh, the, uh, the res that result. On the top, uh, uh, there's IVF, and we actually found that in between the adjusted and unadjusted, we could actually explain away the excess risk of birth defects uh, in IVF, uh, pretty much entirely through maternal factors and conditions in pregnancy. Now, that's good for understanding the etiology, but it actually doesn't change the burden of, uh, the, the, the burden of ill health that's then passed on to uh, the hospital subsequently. Uh, the worst risk was actually for clomiphene citrate at home, where there some people were simply told to go home with this drug. Uh, however, ovulation induction inside the clinic appeared to be pretty good. Um, there's a paper tomorrow on, on clomiphene citrate, and I refer you to that, so I shan't dwell on it here. We then moved on to look at the perinatal outcomes, and we considered all of these outcomes, and in one way or another, every single one of these is worse in the ART group. Not a single one is better, uh, which is a, 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 bit of a, uh, a bit of a litany of woe. We can summarise uh, some of that here, uh, and then, of course, the, what we then observed was the ovulation induction that was outside the clinic had the worst outcomes of anything. So, in fact, if you've got infertility and you want to get decent treatment, then an IVF clinic is probably the best place for you, rather than relying on, on uh, ovulation induction drugs over the web, uh, which was associated, you know, well, poorly supervised uh, ovulation induction was associated with fourfold increased risk of stillbirth, sevenfold increase in neonatal death. Now, the final point is, can we actually learn something from this litany of woe. Um, some, people, some people actually argue that, of course, you're going to see more increased uh, adverse outcomes because uh, you're treating older women. So we actually went and tested it. And then we actually found that, the, that the, the pattern of birth defects that we see in women going through assisted conception don't match uh, what we see in the general population. Um, now, a little bit about uh, fecundity firstly. Uh, it's extremely difficult to actually look at this, uh, study this as an epidemiologist, because you can't hang around watching people having sex and verifying it. Um, uh, so we rely on the historical cohorts for, for trying to extrapolate this from the Hutterites and other groups that were non-concepting and, and trying to uh, conceive. And there seems as though this is, uh, there's an inflection point around the age of 35 to 37, which many of you know about. And then it's basically a, a straight line, decline 10% percentage points a year between 35 and 45 in terms of the chance of conceiving. Now, interestingly, that chance of live birth uh, is argued to be made up of, of not just chance of fertilisation, but it's actually made up of increased rates of aneuploidy and increased pregnancy loss up to the age of 40, So, which is an interest, interesting argument. Now, what we found in our data was that, in fact, we, on the left-hand column, we could replicate the increased rates of birth defect across five-year age bands or uh, uh, across age bands in the general population where it increases from 5.6 up to 8.2 percent. Okay, that's fair enough. However, what we found uh, in, in both the IVF and uh, ICSI, the, the direction is actually reversed. And when you pull them together, the group with the absolute lowest risk of, of any birth defect are the women over 40 who have a live birth and they're remarkably healthy. And what we also discovered was it's not due to terminations for defect because the terminations are also low. Uh, this, uh, by contrast, the, the risks in the young women uh, are really uh, alarmingly high, uh, pushing up over, over 89%. Uh, there's several ex possible explanations for this. 
for the effect in the younger women it could be that, that there is some strange cohort effect where these women have been exposed to something really unpleasant in the environment or in their occupation or something, or they've got an underlying disease. There could be some other confounding factor, but we don't know what it is and nobody else can think of it either. Or uh, in young women, it could be that they're actually over-responding. They've got a different etiology for their infertility and they're over-responding in some adverse way to, to the ovulation induction. In the older women, again, that could be, could it be survivorship of top quality follicles for these women? But why don't the, why don't the follicles survive in, in natural conceptions as well? Is it actually the loss of poor quality embryos? Well, it doesn't seem to be that. We can't see evidence of that. Or is it actually some other uh, miraculous restoration of central function that's controlling the, uh, the restoration of ovulation uh, and the resumption of meiosis in these women, reducing the risk of aneuploidy? Well, there's actually some evidence to support this um, uh, because you can do reciprocal ovarian transplants and in two different species. One's, one's actually um, uh, looked at a senescent model uh, in, the, in the lethal yellow agouti and then found that transplanting the old ovary into a young mouse extends the reproductive career of that ovary uh, back to normal or that of a young mouse. And conversely, somebody's developed a, 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 a model of congenital heart defects which increases dramatically with age and if you, if you gain to a reciprocal ovarian transplant and take the old ovary and put it in a young mouse, uh, it removes the increased risk of cardiac uh, defects in the offspring from that ovary. So it seems though it's biologically plausible that, at least for certain outcomes, it's the age of the mother that's important, not the age of the ovary. And I'm wondering whether, there is there, whether there's a parallel opportunity for investigating something like that in humans. Okay, so where do we want to go from here? Well, we want more data because, you know, the, the, whole, the whole landscape has changed. We want to get on top of these rapid changes. Uh, we want to do this again in, in other places with other cohorts and other populations. We want a further long-term follow-up of, of these populations. Uh, and, uh, and we have a grant at the moment looking at intellectual disability potentially. Um, we also want to link the mother's well-being, and we've actually already got permission to link uh, uh, some drugs from the PBS um, to the pregnancy outcomes, because at the moment, none of the drugs in the PBS are tested on pregnant women, none of them are tested on human embryos, and we have this really, uh, we have a blind loop that's not going anywhere between the adverse reporting system and, and prescribing patterns. We really, we could have that happen in real time these days, and that's going to be a really important challenge. And then finally, you know, we want to link to other, other you know, outcomes of interest that are 20th century uh, uh, epidemics, uh, and we want to collaborate in mechanistic studies because there's stuff that you do that we can't, we can never do. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you.